So we're continuing with our series of the Kingdom of Heaven. And I want to talk about spiritual warfare this morning. Spiritual warfare. And so some of our antennas goes up because we love spiritual warfare. And others are like, oh, I don't want to do anything with the spiritual realm or angels or demons or all those other things. But I think it's important for us as we're going through this series of the Kingdom of Heaven. It's the seventh week that we're working now into. I think we could actually have done a, a follow-up because there's so much meat with regarding spiritual warfare, spirituality, all those things. But I'd just like us to g- give a little bit of an overview in terms of this and just, just get a few points for us to understand and have peace in this thing. But just what I want to say is with regarding um, teaching and all these things, it's such a privilege to be able to bring the Word of God, to teach um, and to be in a place where we can disciple one another. And the important thing is, as we've shared this, this weekend with the men as well, is that we as elders got a responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God. We cannot only focus on our pet subjects and the things we like. We need to give this whole spectrum in some other way so that the church could be equipped and discipled and can move forward. So today we're going to touch a little bit on spiritual warfare and uh, just, just want us to navigate through that and just give us something of handles and peace as we um, navigate this forward. So if we talk about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and as Yapia said, it's so easy to understand the kingdom. If we talk about, if you read scripture and you say the kingdom of God and we're wondering what that is, simple terminology is where the king is, there his kingdom is. Where Jesus is, there his kingdom is. And where he rules and where he reigns, that's where his kingdom is established. So where the king is, there his kingdom is as well. So where there's deliverance, where um, someone gave their heart to the Lord, where church is being planted, where people are taking the gospel, it's like this influence of the kingdom is going and extending into other nations and things. And friends, the kingdom of heaven is not, the economy of the kingdom of heaven is people. It's not business, it's not money. It's not about power. It's not about influence. It's about the kingdom of God. It's, it's something that you cannot see, but it's something that you can see the influence of where it goes and what it does. And so for us, it's so amazing Then when we go out into the nations and all these other things. So we, we need to be focused at home. We need to focus at the people that God has brought into church. But there's something of a going as well. It's something like you're taking your ambassador, you're taking your, your land's flag, and you're going and you're putting it in the North Pole, the South Pole, in Germany in southern america wherever we're going this gospel is going and pioneers are putting those flags down and saying the kingdom of heaven we are praying that it will be advancing and will be going out from here so that's just something of an overview of the kingdom of heaven and so what we need to understand with this kingdom is that there is a confrontation between the kingdom of light which we are in christ's kingdom and the kingdom of darkness and where, where, they, where they are, there's going to be confrontation. So wherever you bring the gospel, you can know that you will get resistance. Wherever you want to um, bring in the word of God, you're going to get resistance. So be re- prepared for that, because that is what the enemy does. He's, he's pushing back. And sometimes we are coming with pure motives. We don't, sometimes we don't even understand and see what's happening. But because we are in Christ, the enemy is on our case. He's attacking us, and we don't always see that. And so it's important for us at church to know and understand that how do we identify these things? How do we know when I'm under spiritual attack? And so I want to say there's two grounds. Some people are very spiritual. Everything is a spiritual attack. We need to drive our demons in corners and we need, there's a demon behind every bush. And on the other side, there's some, that fo- some folk that just totally neglect the spiritual realm. They just totally neglect. There's no devil. There's no spirit. And I don't really want to talk about spirits. That's what they're saying. I don't want to be interactive with demons. I don't want all those things. So on this one side, there's almost like a neglect of the the, the dark forces. But we need to have this balance that we're not going to yach the devils all around and we're not going to neglect it as well. We're going to look at scripture as well. But there's a clash. We need to understand where you're going to bring light. The darkness wants to push back. So be aware of that. And so the Bible is full of the language of war. Such as battle, fight, struggle, strive, resist, attack, enemy, armor, soldier, advance, oppose, and and confront. The warfare is real. However, it is not material but spiritual. Forces of evil and evil philosophy. So we need to understand it's not a physical thing, but it it expresses sometimes in the physical. So we need to understand it's 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 an unseen realm that we cannot see. I just want to focus a little bit on our King Jesus, that this King of Kings, this Lord of all. He's not... Living Jesus in a major anymore. He is the king that's coming, that's going to rule and he's going to reign. 
Firstly, Jesus came as the Lamb of God that was um, a sacrifice for our sins. When Jesus comes again, He's going to come again as the King, as the Ruler, as the Lion of Judah. When Jesus comes, He's going to roar. He's already paid a price. He has already been beaten. He, um, he was cursed for our sake so that we could be saved. So the Lamb was slain, but now the King is going to come. He's going to come victoriously, and He's going to come with a sword. And if we read in Scripture, we can see that His robe is dipped in blood. He's got a sword. And so sorry, ladies, for the graphics, but man, it's going to be, a, a tough, uh, let's say, a tough time. But our, our King Jesus, there's masculinity within Him. He is, he's a man. He's ruling. He's, gonna, he's a king. He's going to take ground. He's going to push the, 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 the evil forces back. And so we can know that Jesus isn't this small person and just meek and humble, but He's ruling and He's reigning and He's going to come back roaring. And Isaiah 9 verse 1 to 2, I'm just reminded of what, we've, what the Old Testament was saying about Jesus. And as you are reading these things in the Old Testament, you can see it's being fulfilled in the New Testament. Um, Isaiah 9 verse 1 to 2, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the, of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And so if we read in the New Testament, we see that wherever Jesus was, He, he brought people they could see. They were raised from the Lazarus was raised from the dead. And where Jesus went, it was people was looking at Him. And this was the light that was walking in this, into an area that's so dark and crooked. And there was no hope. In Isaiah 42, verse 6 to 7, I, the Lord, have called you, and it's speaking to actually about Jesus, to demonstrate my righteousness. I will uh, take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. That's where Jesus is. Where he is? And he takes that person out of the dark dungeon and he brings them into the light. Can you imagine? And for us that encounter Jesus where we were in the place of utter darkness, in dungeons, where we were um, uh, full of trauma and uh, tormented by demons. Jesus comes, He took us by the hand, He says, My son, my daughter, I love you. I've got a plan and a purpose for you. And we stand in this place and we're like, Lord, I do not deserve this. I deserve this dungeon. I deserve to be tormented. I do not, be, I'm, do not, I'm not, do not deserve your love and your mercy and your joy. But still Jesus says, My son, my daughter, I've chosen you. And Jesus came to bring light. Isaiah 58 verse 10, Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. And uh, just encouragement for us as a church, that where we are going and we are helping the poor, um, where uh, feed the hungry and help those in trouble, then your light will shine. Where we are going, when we are doing something good for people, sometimes we don't even have to speak the words of Jesus, although it's good that we do that. Just our acts are bringing light into situations. I remember at school we we weren't so well. Um, it was so well our financial only. We 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 get, came by, but it wasn't too great. And I remember uh, there was a lady that brought groceries for us um, one one month, and it was like light shined in, in in our house at that moment. And we were we were in despair. We were almost in a place of um, depressed, and we're not knowing where's our uh, where's the finances going to come from. And I remember that lady p putting the groceries down before um, I got born again. She put the groceries down. It was like something of the light came into the house. Um, and from there on, um, just God's favor and goodness that we've seen and ultimately led to my salvation. Isaiah 10, 60 verse 1 to 3. I'm just reminded that Rudolf and Sonia Skitter gave this to us last year, June, for us as a church. But just as this the future kingdom, future glory for Jerusalem, Isaiah 60 verse 1 to 3. Arise, Jerusalem. I want to say, Arise, River Flow Church. Let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. What influence we've got on this world, eh? So Jesus is our ultimate king. He's our deliverer and he's our Lord. I just want us to look at Colossians 1 verse 13 to 14, just in the New Testament that says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of 
darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son, which is the light, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Isn't that amazing? Jesus comes and He saved us. Even the New Testament, that He's showing this to us. And He's showing us, friends, we do not have to live in spiritual darkness anymore. Jesus, if, if you are born again, He's bringing you out of a place of darkness into a place of light. We just need to accept Him and know that He will guide us on this path. And so, um, Colossians 1 verse 13 can be interpreted in these ways. Kingdom of the darkness is a spiritual realm. It's invisible. Um, as depicted by Paul in Ephesians 6 verse 12, where it says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So there's a really good scripture to show us that it's an unseen realm. And so often, guys, we find ourselves, we want to punish the flesh. We want to talk to that person that scales us. We want to get the, the political party sorted, and we've got names and flesh and all those things, and we want to sort them out. But Scripture is clear that it's not a physical battle. Um, although we can challenge or we can talk and we can, can bring correction, our hearts should never be to kill and kill a person or want him out of the picture in the sense of wanting him to die. That's not God's heart. God is pro-life. What we are doing is there's a demon behind the thing. There's a, there's a, there's a the spiritual force behind that person that is clinging to his soul in a sense, and he's making decisions and he's saying things that is hurting and is breaking down. So when you see these things, we love the person, but we hate the sin. We hate the thing that's, that's cutting there. That's the thing that we, are, that we are needing to see. And so often we, we put a label on a person. And actually, we are not there to judge. Jesus will sort out. He will vindicate. We, we act in love. And the moment when we... This is a really um, amazing thing that I've learned in, in life. If someone comes with a evil spirit, you give them the opposite spirit. When your wife says to you, blah, 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 you come with the opposite spirit. When someone scales you, you come with the opposite spirit. You, because if you, um, if you uh, escalate, he's escalating. So this thing just, and then it becomes abusive and all these other things. So remember this, whenever you, you feel like, yes, there's a scaling, there's something happening, um, there's a pushing, there's, a, there's conflict, Remember, bring the opposite spirit. That is when we, when we can, can start to work with, with people. Um, friends, another thing that I just want to encourage us, and just a reminder that these are mighty powers in the dark world. Do not try to fight these things on your own. You will come second. The Israelites, God showed the world through, the, through His nation that you cannot live righteously on the law alone. You need a savior. You need someone that can wash you with the blood. You need someone that is stronger than the enemy. And so when we confront the enemy, it, we come in the power and the authority of Jesus and not our own. Now, the seven sons of Sceva, it's an act. They came and they said, I cast you out in the name of Paul and of Jesus. And, this, and the enemy comes and he says, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? And with the enemy, his tactics will always be, he will try to um, attack your identity. He will say, if you are the son of God. And he says, and he, he knew, the enemy knew that he, they are not in Christ. They're just, uh, they just ex exorcism. They're just driving out these demons, but they are not in Christ. And the enemy sorted them out. They, and it says they ran out of the house naked. And so when we come to Christ Jesus, we need to know we, need, we operate in the, under the authority of Jesus Christ and not under our own, own authority. Okay, this, <clears throat> the second point is... Um, Okay, so just with regarding Ephesians 6 verse 12, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, I think I've got it on, just after Ephesians 6 verse 12. Um, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So we come with the, with the mighty weapons of God and not our own weapons. And so sometimes we think we can come with food pro uh, schemes and, and political ways or manipulation, or we come with our our clever ideas, and we find out, yo, this thing is just draining me. It's not working. We come with Scripture when we come with the authority of Christ. Okay, so what I want to say is that um, the darkness doesn't necessarily manifest at night when we sleep. Ooh. So sometimes we look at these horror movies, and we think the, the darkness is only when I'm sleeping, and 
my eyes are closed, then stuff is shifting and things are happening, and we think that is spiritual warfare, that is when things happen. Friends, actually, when the enemy operates is when we are awake, and he's working in man's heart. He's working in humans' hearts because he's wanting to manipulate. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Actually, it's when we are awake when the mulakeit happens because he's using people. I'm going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about his strategy, what his motives are. But we need to understand it's not the spiritual realm is not when we are sleeping. It's real when we are awake. Satan dominates the hearts and minds of sinful hum- humanity. Before salvation, people's minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the, the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. That's Ephesians 4 verse 18, if you want to make a note. Ephesians 4 verse 18. Romans 1 verse 21. Colossians 1 verse 12. Romans 13 verse 12. 1 John 2 verse 10, Ephesians 5 verse 8. So those are the scriptures that backs in the sense of Satan dominate. He wants, he's using man's heart. He's using man's ways. He's trying to to manipulate situations and putting lies in our ears and our minds and perceptions of stuff that's not even true. And people are driving stuff. They, uh, are, um, they are in war. They are um, skinnering. There's stuff happening because of the work of the enemy. Because we are opening up our hearts to the things of the enemy. So that's mainly the way that he works. Just with regarding, I, d- I don't want to go deep into demonology and, and those kind of things. But when a person manifests that's controlled by a demon, when, he, when a demon comes in and manifests, that's his last ground to stand on. Because he was operating in the dark. The moment when you bring him into the light, when he confronts Jesus, that's when he starts to manifest. His last, his last plan is to scare us. He, want, he doesn't want to get out. He wants to use that flesh so he can accomplish and destroy people. So when a person manifests, we know we are on the right track. Because that thing needs to come out. And, we, and it's, the, and it's, the, and it's the, the power of God that can bring that person out. So I've heard an analogy before that... You know, we're, as humans, because we don't know about these things, so we, we, we are not confronted with it a lot. When uh, the, the, the dark sphere is operating and things are happening, sometimes things in the, in the physical happen that we don't understand why that's happening. So sometimes you'll get, and it's not often that it happens, some glass moves or something like that. I haven't seen that often, but we know that this, the spiritual realm is real. It does manifest in the flesh. I remember Chris Ely told how people they go, went into a nation, they brought the gospel, and that, that elder that was, um, what he, he's like, a, I don't want to use the word Sangoma, but he was like a, 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 his spiritual rituals, he was, he was full of, of the darkness. And when I spoke curses, it was like things are happening around the tent. So all those things do happen. But he, it's a scaring tactic. So as a fish is swimming in the sea and is breathing, water in and as a bird is flying in the air that's the way that god has created it and so what a demon does is he comes like and he's like and he's like he's taking another and he's like he wants to see our reaction and so there's nothing to be afraid of when stuff like this happens we're just like get out in jesus name you're not welcome here and that's that's the authority that we've got and so we get so scared of the things of the enemy he just wants he wants to Pull out the fear of us. He wants to see the fear. And when we open up our hearts to the fear, he's got a little bit of a foothold. And so we need to close our hearts to these things and say, get away, man. You don't belong here. The, me and my house, I will serve the Lord. So when, let's use the word paranormal activities happen or those kind of things happen. Just say, gone in Jesus' name. You don't belong here. So we do sometimes see that the, the spiritual realm do manifest in the physical. So everything that we see and touch is uh, is what's it? You know, permanent. It's um, temporary. It's temporary. Everything will be shaken. Everything will fall away. But the kingdom of God will always stand. Eternal life will be forever. So the things that we see is temporary. It's not going to last forever. But that realm that we cannot see is an everlasting realm. And there's going to come a day when Jesus is going to come 
and there's going to be judgment and the demons and the, and, and, and the devil and all those who haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior are going to be cast into the fire of hell. And all those who accept the Jesus as Lord and Savior will be with him forever and ever. So I just want to show us something practical with regarding when stuff happens, don't let that thing sit in your mind. Think, oh, the devil is in my eyes. Oh, oh, all oh, oh, oh. For us as husbands, we are the king of our house. And we need to say, Kutak, in Jesus' name, you're not welcome here. That's where we as husbands need to take authority. We don't leave it to our wives, because our wives are sometimes much more spiritual and stronger than we are in that sense. But we need to take responsibility as men. It doesn't say we as wives can't do those things, but we, need, we as men need to take responsibility. I'm so reminded that one guy said, his wife says, hey, there's someone at the door. And he says, hey, go, you go, you go check. I'm going to stay here. And, you know, once this month, we need to sort those things out. Okay, so Lucifer and the fallen angels. Spiritual warfare originates with the fall of Satan. Satan was an um, angelic being created by God to guard his throne, a prominent and privileged uh, position. From Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, we see that Satan had great beauty, splendor, and wisdom. However, he fell from this privileged position because of the sin of proud ambition. Not content to be highly exalted, he wanted to be above God and was thrown out of heaven. That's uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 17 and Isaiah 14 verse 13 to 14. Isaiah 14 verse 13 to 14. So with regarding Ezekiel and Isaiah, I just want to mention, that's a dual symbol. One of Nebuchadnezzar, the king that was bringing the, uh, he was a destroyer. He came and he had absolute verwoosting gesai. And it brings the parallel picture of what the enemy came to do. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. So when we read Isaiah 28 and uh, ach, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, remember it's a dual picture of the king and what he's showing is this fallen angel, Lucifer. Um, and so we know in scripture that one third of the angels fell and two thirds of the angels remained with God. They had to come to a place where they say, I'm against God, I'm for God. And God judged them at that moment and Satan fell with those angels. Remember they were beautiful. And scripture talks about their beauty was taken away from them. And so the demons and Satan, they are one third of the angels that fell and they are operating and working in, on, on, this, on this earth. So just a caution with regarding books and all those other things. There's a lot of books that talk about demons are different colors and all those things. Church, I want to caution us with those kind of things. We don't see that in scripture. Scripture is our reference. Don't go into too much detail with regarding those kind of things. Um, we need to understand that uh, Scripture is our final basis. Friends, just as I'm preaching, just in my heart, just the Lord is dropping something. I want to come back to this thing of we need to equip the church for the works of service. As we are talking about the things of the darkness, I know that we might feel uncomfortable, but it's our responsibility to talk about these things. Not often people want to talk about these things, and we're going to get our information from other people, but it's not helpful. So we need to talk about this. So please stick with me. Please bear with me. Uh, we haven't had this kind of teaching in years, so I just want to prepare us and know about, that you know about this. Um, often the church is, is got, is got, faces a lot of spiritual battles, and Often the church doesn't know about it. Mostly the elders and those can, we, we battle with those things. I want to encourage the church to pray with us. We've got a lot of spiritual attacks on the church and on individuals and us as leaders. So we as a church need to be in unity and we need to pray and stand together because the spiritual realm is real. Things are happening. People are getting hurt. The enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy, but we as a church can stand together and um, defeat the enemy. Okay, so his name means, okay, so it's important for us to understand who the enemy is so that we know how to work with him or defeat him and all those other things. If we, we need to know the enemy that we are fighting against, right? So his name means accuser, a devil, which means slanderer, a deceiver of the whole world, a ruler of the world, a god of this age, so small g, he's not the, the god of gods, a prince of the power of the air, a bill, bills a bull. The prince of demons. So we can see that these are the names that's being referred to as Satan or Lucifer. Don't want to go into too much detail, but that is the names that we can um, know about. The goal is 
attacking and destroying God's works of creation, man and the universe, and his works of redemption, Israel, Christ, and the church. So that's his, he's continually attacking. John 10 verse 10 says, the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus came to give us life and life in abundance. So one of the strategies of the enemy is to take our eyes off of Jesus. He will do anything to take your eyes off of Jesus. He will bring stuff and he will bring, he make you busy and he will bring a moving glass or whatever the case may be. He just wants to take your focus off of Jesus. Because if your focus is off of Jesus, like Peter, he was walking on the water. When he had take his eyes off of Jesus, he was sinking in the water. The enemy's main strategy is to take our focus off of Jesus. Um, the enemy is promoting an um, alternative world system of which he is in the head. He wants to operate things so that he can stay in control. That's why it says that he is the small g God of this world, so that he can be in control of certain things. Um, he's gaining glory and worship for himself. That is his goal. The kingdom of darkness is a realm controlled by sin and rebellion toward God. 1 John 1 verse 6. The kingdom of darkness is a domain dominated by death. The kingdom of darkness is a domain dominated by death. He wants to bring death and destruction. I'm reminded in 1 Corinthians 15, I think it says, Thanks be to God who gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, I focus Jesus. Jesus brings life. The enemy wants to bring death. Okay, so we know that the enemy is being defeated by Jesus Christ. It says, if you look um, at that picture in, in the Garden of Eden, God was uh, speaking and he says that the snake will, uh, will strike your heel, but you will crush its head. And when Jesus came, the snake um, pierced, uh, it, it uh, striked Jesus' heel. He died on a cross. He went to the grave. But Jesus defeated, he crushed his head. The enemy's head is crushed. And so we, we need to understand that Jesus and the enemy is not wrestling. Jesus already defeated him. It's now our opportunity, it's now our time as the church. I want to say they use, they use the, in our foundations book, they work. We are there to do the cleaning up work. We are doing the mopping up work. We are there to clean. We are there to, to drive away, drive out. We are there to deliver. We are there to bring light to the people who need Jesus. That is the church opportunity now. Because of Jesus, we've got the clean up work to do. A little bit of messy work, but when that's done, it's over. We're going to get our crowns. Of, of glory. Um, Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 5, I said to write that down. I haven't got it up on the screen. But God is so rich in mercy and He loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, remember the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy, we were dead because of, of our sinful nature. He gave us life when He raised Jesus from the dead. When Jesus was raised, He brought life into this world. So, the enemy is def being defeated, Galatians 3 verse 13. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So when Jesus died and he was resurrected, that curse fell on him. And that curse is no, no longer on us. Friends, we need to understand when Adam and Eve sinned, curse came into the mankind. And for those who are not born again, from Adam, we've got generational curses. We've got things in people's lives that came from that time on. And so we can sometimes dissect and examine things. Okay, maybe there was, um, uh, what's those, all those, those things of, uh, of generational curses. There's a lot of things of generational curses. You can, they talk about your bloodlines and all those things. And we see in scripture that those things are true. But when Christ came, that thing stopped. We need to understand that. When we, we think Oma Khriki and Oma, and now we can't get pregnant because we've got a generational curse, you just break that thing in Jesus' name. And you've, you don't have that general generational curse going down anymore. There's a lot of things. We've got all these generational curses that comes down that, that people can talk about. Um, suicide, all those things. I'm talking, I'm touching on things that's, that's, that, that's working in people's hearts right now. But as these things are coming down, we need to understand that Jesus came and His blood is sufficient to cut those things off. And we've got to have the faith to know that if I pray that prayer, Jesus, break this curse over my life. Because of your blood, we need to know it's going to happen. And friends, we don't serve Jesus to gain from Him. We serve Him because we love Him. Because He's the King of Kings. 
We don't only serve him so that we can get the enemy off our back. We serve him because we want to be with him. That's the focus. That's the goal. And uh, yeah, so the enemy is being defeated. God is in control. Satan is not co-equal with God. Fallen angels are outnumbered. The enemy's power was severely reduced with Christ's incarnation and resurrection. Jesus gives believers power and authority to do the same. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has bound the strong man, and we can now rob him of his possessions. Jesus has bound the enemy. We can rob him now. That's, that's what it says in Mark 6, verse 7, and Luke 10. Jesus talks about who can come in and bound the enemy. And he says, I can, and he bounds the enemy. Now we can take all his possessions. Now we can redeem what the enemy has stolen from us. Okay, some practical handles. How do we deal with the enemy? So we are a church that needs to be equipped. How do we deal with these things? We deal in a similar way that Jesus has dealt with it. As Jesus walked and he had authority and he dealt with things, that's the same way that we're going to do, we're going to deal with it. Jesus' words and experience also attest to the reality of spiritual warfare. He often spoke about it and he experienced and engaged in it. He was tempted by the devil. He, were, he was resisted by evil men. And he confronted the kingdom of darkness by casting out demons, healing the sick, and raising the dead. His supreme, supreme confrontation was, of course, on the cross. And his supreme victory over the forces of evil was demonstrated by his resurrection. So that is how we deal with these things. That we see what Jesus has done and we just do the same. We are not going to do other fancy and tricky stuff. Friends, I want to encourage us. It's the blood of Jesus plus nothing, and it's the blood of Jesus minus nothing. So for us as a church, we need to come to a place of understanding. Oils, we've got oil, anointing oils, is not going to drive our demons. Flags of Israel over your back is not going to heal you. It's the blood of Jesus. We cannot say, I cast you out in Jesus' name, and then oil, and then flags, and then all these other things. Isn't Jesus' blood enough? These are just symbols. It's going to do nothing. It's only the blood of Jesus. So sometimes we are fighting the enemy and we, we don't have faith in Jesus' blood enough. We think we need to add other stuff. We need to get stuff from Jerusalem and Israel. We need to get sand and, and water and all those things and pay um, thousands of dollars to get it here so that it could have more power. Friends, Jesus' blood is enough. His blood is enough. We need to understand that. And friends, it's not up to us. If we lay hands on someone to get healed, it's not our responsibility for them to get healed. It's Jesus' responsibility. We step in faith, we lay our hands on the person, and, it's, and Jesus is the healer, not me. If, if darkness doesn't flee when we lay hands on people, or whatever the case may be, it's in Jesus' hands, not ours. We, we just do what Jesus has called us to do. So, with regarding um, deliverance and all these other things, oftentimes when, what you find is people are in dark places, they are in places of they need deliverance, they are in places where they are so tormented. And so what we often do, what happens for us as a church, it's good, we need to deliver people, we need to go and pray for them, we need to cast out the, the darkness, we need to go and sit with them and pray with them, that's good, that's what we've got to do. But friends, there's, there's a more effective way of doing things. We as a church are going to run our legs stompy, going off the people, casting out and driving out and all these things. In a month or two, we're going to go back and we're going to drive those same things out. And it's going to be seven times more difficult because if you, talk, if you read it, Scripture, Jesus casted out a demon and he says, um, he needs, Jesus needs to fill that room. Otherwise, seven more demon, demons and more powerful will come back. So that is in, in terms of a demon coming in, physically taking control of a person's body. But similar to character, if we are working with people and they're not working through those things, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Unforgiveness. Whatever. You can call all those sins. If we take it out and we try to bring it back, in a sense of we're not willing to deal with it, if we're not willing to fill it with Jesus, it's going to come back more stronger and stronger. So this analogy, if this is a person's life and there's a fly in, a filthy thing, we want to get that thing out. It's easy. Just shake it out. That's what we as a church do. We go and we cast the stuff out. We say, go out, fly and then the person is better. But after a few minutes, that thing is back again. Yes, like, no, we need to go and fix this thing again. Friends, fill this cup with water, and that fly will not come in again. 
what we are building into people's lives is going to determine that that thing is not going to come in again. So as we are discipling and working with people, don't just cast out. Build the kingdom of God into their lives. Let them be filled with Jesus. The encouragement is sit with them. Don't just cast out. Let them see what the problem is. Let them work it through. And let them be filled with Jesus. And then that thing will, will not enter again. So you cannot give someone what you're not full of. We need to be filled with, the, with Christ, with the water. And that thing will not come, come back in again. So that's why discipleship is so important. We deliver, we go with the deliverance ministry, we cast out things, but we build, we build with people, we build the scriptures into their lives. So discipleship has got a big role to play. So we start with evangelism. At Paul's conversion, Jesus said that he was sending Paul out as a servant to open people's eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Acts 26 verse 18. I love what Michael Ethan just says. The power is given to us. We are taught how to live. There should be no problem. But the devil is a complicating factor. When we are saved, we get a new friend. But we also get a new enemy. Look at Ephesians 6 verse 10 to 11. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. And His mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. I remember before I came to salvation, I was so afraid of the enemy. You know, it was like, I know I had to keep a distance, but the, in, my, in, my, in my heart, in my thinking, there's got to be a, some of an alliance that he doesn't destroy my life so badly that, you know, I'm not talking about playing glossy, glossy, all those things. In our hearts, sometimes we are not, it's not real our enemy. In a sense, it's almost our ally so that we can negotiate those kind of things. But friends, when you come into the kingdom of God, you've got a new enemy. You are not playing around with him. He's evil. He's got plans of destruction and he wants to kill, steal and destroy. We need to know when we come into Christ, this is the price that we're going to pay. We want to deal with sin, we want to deal with the enemy, and we want him out of our lives. And that's the decision we've got to make. We cannot have open doors open to the enemy anymore. Friends, I'm, <laughs> I, I really feel strong about this. The Lord is pressing us on my heart. Do not open up doors to the enemy. Unforgiveness, it's one of the biggest things when, when we do deliverance, is there's a thing of unforgiveness toward people. And the thing is holding, and it's holding, and it's holding, and more things are opening up doors to other areas. We've got to close the, those doors. When we are in Christ, we are not negotiating anymore. We are saying, be gone in Jesus' name. You do not belong here. And so, with regarding coming to Christ, we are sh we, that's why it's so important when we come to salvation that we've got a team around us that was witnesses that saw what has happened. And then we, got, be, we get uh, baptized. Baptism is a symbol of showing the world and sh showing the spiritual realm that I'm meaning business. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to stand on the fence anymore. I'm, I'm dying to myself and I'm resurrected as a new person in Jesus. And friends, whenever you are attacked by the enemy, you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. Know that. You no longer live. Christ lives in me. The enemy wants to attack. Come. I'm not inviting him, but I'm saying, Jesus is the one that is in me now. He's not attacking me. He's attacking Jesus. Actually, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. Church, I hope this is helpful. A lot of information. We can go into much more depth and detail of, of these kind of things. But I want us as a church to know that we can be strong in Jesus. We need nonsense fighting. Men, we need to stand our ground. And we need to protect our wives. You think what happened with Adam and Eve, with, happened with Eve in the Garden of Eden, is that Adam failed to protect his wife. The, the, he saw that the snake came. And he saw that he, uh, Eve was taking the fruit. And God warned Adam before. He said, you need to shama. You need to protect. And when that snake comes, you say, loose in Jesus' name. Get out. And you take your wife away from that situation. You do not let her engage with the enemy. So that is how we as husbands need to lead. We need to shama. We need to protect our wives, our children. Where there's things where we see it's not right, don't let it linger. Sort it out. Let it get away from us. So strong message. After the men's camp, a little bit of, of strong words. 
but I believe this is helpful and we can move forward from here. If you've got any questions, please come and speak to us as an as a, as a eldership or a team. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. And we'll see you Wednesday here at the venue. And we'll have like a fellowship. I'd love to pray for us. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your great love, your joy and your peace. Jesus, our Prince of Peace. Just reminded Jesus where you walked on earth limited to your body, the, the, your flesh, you were in, only able to do so much, but Lord, you had such an impact in people's lives because it was God Almighty in the flesh. That flesh was crucified so that we could be saved and set free. And now we've got the Spirit of God in us. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, church lives in us this morning, lives in us, if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. So friends, we can do the things that God where Jesus is done on earth. We can raise the dead. We can pray for healing. We can cast out. We can bring hope to a lost and dying world. It's adventure that's waiting us. But our focus is not on the enemy. Our focus is on Jesus. We're not going to go into areas where Jesus has not called us to go. We're not going to do things where Jesus has not called us to do. We're going to stay faithful to what Jesus has called us to do because He's going to hold us accountable to what He has called us to do. We're not going to do other stuff. We're going to do what Jesus has called us to. And so Jesus, as a church, we want to respond. We want to say we want to close those doors right now in Jesus' name. We say, Satan, loose in the name of Jesus. You've got no hold on over this church or any individual that's part of this church. I want to thank you, Jesus, that we are an overcoming church, that we will rule and that we will reign through and under the mighty power of Jesus. And Father, I want to thank you that we'll have a great impact in this world. Father, I pray that we will not be super spiritual looking for demons around every bush, but that we would be solid, neutral, standing on the Word of God, knowing there's a spiritual realm, but knowing this, that there's the natural as well that we need to live in. Father, thank you that you've equipped us, that you are, that you are busy preparing us for greater things. We as a church want to say, Jesus, we love you. We keep our focus on you. I want to thank you, Father, for sending your Son. I want to thank you for, the Scripture talks about, He has crushed Jesus so that we could be redeemed. Thank you for sending your Son. And we stand humble before you, King Jesus, who is worthy to open up the scroll. Only the King of kings and the Lord of all. Jesus is going to come back as a roaring lion, and we're going to be behind Him, moving forward, and not against Him. In Jesus' name, Amen.